Hey, how you doing? I'm Gareth. Uh, I have been in the games industry most of my life. I have been in the blockchain games industry since 2014. Um, I created some of, well, probably the, the earliest tech for doing this stuff called Bitbind. Um, and I've made a bunch of games on the blockchain, actual games. Um, so I'm going to try and talk about that a little bit. It uh, connects nicely to what Tony was just saying about the future uh, and what we might do with the blockchain and where games are going. Um, don't have a huge amount of time, so what I'm going to try and do is pull out a couple of really specific points in a bunch of different areas. Uh, each of them could be a whole talk itself. If you've got questions, come find me later. I'll be around tomorrow as well. Um, but yeah, I'm Gareth. I'm from Deckbound, and I'm going to talk about game design. OK, so procedural generation, player ownership, both on the commercial side and on the item side, player access, and then a little bit about rights holders. These are all really different topics, and I'm hoping that there's something that, that you can get out of these, even if maybe not all of them. Hopefully, one of them for each of you will be, will be relevant. So let's get started with procedural generation. Um, this isn't anything new at all in the games industry. Games have had procedurally generated content for a very, very long time, and there are games now, some of the games that are talked about most in the industry, that rely solely on procedurally generated content. Uh, and for the game design people and game techie people in the audience, apologies, you'll know this already, but the random numbers that we use in games to do procedural generation aren't actually really random. Uh, we generally rely on uh, pseudo-random numbers, sequences of predictable numbers that we can make interesting things out of. And we do that uh, by providing them with interesting seeds. Uh, we provide seeds into these pseudo-random number generators that generate information in the games that we play. These seeds generally are seen by players as somewhat magical. Uh, they are the, the source of their experiences. They're the things that they share amongst each other. They talk about them. Uh, they get excited about finding new seeds in, in, different, uh, in different games that rely on them. What has this got to do with the blockchain? Well, the blockchain, because it runs on distributed systems, produces interesting numbers, and those interesting numbers can be used as interesting seeds. Um, what we can do here, and really I'm kind of just talking around this to get to a point, is that we can say, oh, by the way, there's a whole other talk about interesting numbers off the blockchain that's very techy, and it's not that easy to do. So just a bit of a call out for the, for the technical members of the audience. Uh, what I'm really interested in this, is, is this bottom bit. How do we close this loop? How do we say, okay, well, we can generate crazy random numbers out of the blockchain, and we can feed them into these random number generators that make these cool procedural games. But how do we, how do we close that loop? Because I think games is a great opportunity to add value on the blockchain side of things. Blockchain is a, just a, a means of storing data. If the data is coming out of a game and feeds the blockchain, the blockchain produces, inter produces these interesting numbers, we can close this loop and we can go round and round. And that's really exciting from a player perspective. The reason I'm pointing this out is that the games industry has been around for a while. We know how to make games. Um, um, there's a lot of science in making and designing games. Um, generally, we're not trying to solve problems from a game design perspective. We're often just looking for the next exciting thing, something that players can get attached to and, uh, and engaged in. And I think this is an excellent opportunity. I th and I'm, I'm going to give other examples of how I think we can add value in using blockchain tech. But this is a particular example of where we can say the blockchain does this cool thing, these random numbers from distributed systems that are hard to fake. Um, so how can we use that in our games? How can we make our games be connected to that? And this is core to a lot of what I've done in, uh, in blockchain games. In fact, the game that I'm working on at the moment, Lunar Mines, um, is a space mining game. You go out there, you mine, you mine space, and you build these cool mines on moons, and you connect them together to build relays, and you send probes from these relays to further the exploration of space. Uh, but this all loops around because what happens is when you send those bro probes as a transaction on the blockchain, that transaction generates information about the star system that you just found, and that, that information then feeds back to the player as a set of planets and moons that they can mine. Uh, this whole thing goes around in a loop, much like I was just describing. So when players are taking ownership of their items because they exist on the blockchain, they're also generating data that goes back into the blockchain that produces new experiences for them. And I think that's something that can be applied to many genres. There's, that most game genres have some form of generation in them. Um, in one form or another, you can figure out a way of applying this. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's the point there on procedural generation. Blockchain tech and games tech actually have this nice little synergy when it comes to procedural generation. We're not necessarily solving a new problem here, but we're potentially doing something cool from a design perspective, and players like it when we do cool things. So that's what we should do. OK, next. This one's nowhere near as much fun. Um, and I'm glad that someone's already spoken about this today, because this is a really big design issue. It's a commercial issue as well, but it's fundamentally a design issue. In the blockchain game space, people talk about player ownership a lot. In the games industry, we don't talk about player ownership that much. And that's because the games industry spent a really long time telling people that they own their things. And they don't. <laughs> Tony's just mentioned that as well. 
Um, there's no shortage of games whose marketing departments will go out of their way to convince players that they own their stuff, whilst their legal teams and technical teams will prove that they don't and prohibit access to them. This is just how it works in the games industry. Um, you don't need to walk far from this room to find people whose day-to-day -day job is doing that very thing. Um, so how do we get around this? What's the, how do we work with this from a blockchain perspective? Because Although we can get excited about player ownership and we can say it's cool if players own their things, does that mean we can actually make games on that principle? Well, it doesn't at the moment. It's quite difficult. So here's just a, a really standard sort of list of things relating to, to ownership in games. This is very simple. But we've got purchasing platform, rights and licensing in the game. What happens when we throw blockchain into the mix here? Well, the first thing that happens is that game items become more relevant. Most of the time at the moment, game items aren't considered as a separate entity from the game. But as has hopefully been proven already today by, by the other speakers, that's really kind of what we're getting at with blockchain stuff, is most of the time we're talking about saying, this cool stuff that's in these games, let's pull it out and make it be a thing by virtue of the blockchain. Well, what impact does that have? And really, I could probably skip over this slide. I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about it very briefly because it's been spoken about already today. But on the purchasing side of things, payment processes won't allow for any money transfer risk. And though there are examples of people having worked around that today, as soon as they recognize what you're doing, they will stop you. This, this isn't a conscious decision on their part to get in our way. This is a legal issue. They can't allow for that. And unless you're willing to operate outside of major markets, you're not going to work around it. So that's a major issue. And at the moment, realistically, the only way around that is to work in crypto directly, to take payments in cryptocurrency, and to deal with these legal risks yourself. That itself is a problem, because you need to have the internal structure to be able to deal with that stuff. On the platform side, even if you get around that, you've then got platform holders. They're not going to allow you to transfer items that have any cash value. And again, there are some examples of people having worked around that. They're not going to last for very long, because these platform holders have huge risk and exposure by virtue of these, these exchanges. And there was some detail provided earlier on Apple's current view on that, uh, which isn't going to change. By the way, that's, that will be how, how they are. They have too many different things attached to this to, to just suddenly say, OK, let's figure out a way of making this work. And then finally, you've got the rights and licensing bit. IP holders currently don't really understand blockchain very well. So if you're in a situation where you're using somebody else's content and you think everything's fine and you do this cool blockchain thing, and then you go to them and you say, well, what we did is we sold your IP to players, and now they own it, you're going to scare them. And that's very difficult to work back. So you've got to work with them up front. And rights and licensing doesn't just mean like franchise titles. It, it means all of the things that are in your game that you have legal agreements with other parties in relation to. You've got to think about all of that stuff. It's quite difficult. Uh, so yeah, that, that was the, the less interesting one. There are game design solutions to these things at a commercial level, but they're, they're, they're messy. For, from an indie perspective, most of us are used to dealing with these commercial things alongside game design things. So it's not that new. but. It's, uh, the ideology of player ownership is great, uh, but the commercial reality of it is a pain in the ass. OK, uh, player ownership items. This is a sort of separate topic, but it's, it's, quite, it's quite related. And also, this is more of a positive one than a negative one. Uh, so players like owning things in games. That is widely established. Blockchain isn't the thing that suddenly come along and said, hey, players want to own their stuff. Players think that they own their things anyway. Players care a lot about the things that they own. They, they care more about the things that they own than we as developers, publishers, and technologists in the industry care about them. And you can go to any genre or game and find examples of this. People really care about the things that they play with. And in the blockchain industry, People seem to care about buying these, these blockchain things, whether they're NFTs or whether they're altcoins or items in a game that isn't doing either. People seem to be demonstrating that they, they, they're interested. However, these two things are not the same. Um, and I would put anyone who owns a crypto kitty up against anyone with a hardcore Diablo character of that status and get them to argue about which one cares more about their thing. Now, this isn't a negative thing. I'm just pointing out the fact that these are not the same. However, people care about both. And we've got people who care on the blockchain side and people care on, on the game side. We're somewhere in the middle, I hope. I don't think any of us are squarely one side or the other. I hope not, anyway. Um, and that's really exciting, because actually, if we can use blockchain to do player ownership things, there's no shortage of people who'll say, yeah, that's awesome. I now actually really own my thing. And over the next couple of years, as people to start to realize more that they don't own their things in traditional games, I think we've got an opportunity to step in. Um, and we kind of get this for free. As designers, we don't actually have to do much here. Um, if blockchain technology becomes a part of how we issue assets in games, then players get that, and we get the benefit of that having happened. 
So there is, and this is more directed at a traditional games development audience than it is a blockchain games one. There's a benefit there just to using blockchain if we use it for the purposes of item ownership. And I think that's really exciting. Okay, player access. This is, this is a different one again. So what I'm talking about here is players accessing systems, getting access to the data that's in their games, exploring their games, building third-party tools around their games. And when I say their games, they're not their games, the games that have been sold to them, but they, they would describe them as their games. And I'm going to use an example for this one. Um, just before I do, just as a, as a qualifier here, what I mean by this is that the games industry traditionally thinks of games as games. They're very siloed, even now in the world of, of games as services. People still think that a game is a game. It's not. I fundamentally disagree with that. The data, the services, the culture, the social structures, there's all of this other stuff around what games are. They are not just a game. But if you've ever worked in a, even a slightly large studio, you get this really, really sort of siloed, isolated view of what games are. And this, this example, I think, is a, is a good way of proving that out from a design perspective. Um, and before I get into it, I'm, I'm not deliberately picking Hearthstone for any particular reason. And I don't think Blizzard did anything wrong here, but it's a really good example from a design perspective. Also, people generally understand how this game works. So in 2014, um, Ellie and Celine Bernstein wrote this paper. Um, they'd done a machine learning thing on Hearthstone. Uh, Ellie's a researcher at Google. He now runs some of their anti-fraud and AI labs. Very sort of senior academic science-y type guy. Uh, and he wanted to present the paper at DEF CON. So he, being a security researcher, knew about things like disclosure and how you normally approach businesses in this situation. He emailed Blizzard and he said, hey, I'm going to give this talk about this thing that I did with Hearthstone. Is that cool? And they said, yeah, that's cool. So he gave, he gave this talk. He went to DEF CON and he gave this talk. Two days later, he got this email from Blizzard saying, actually, with this talk that you gave, this tool that you made that makes all this interesting data, you can't release that. And the tool he made, all it was doing was observing games of Hearthstone as you were playing them. It wasn't accessing private information. It wasn't reading from information that the player didn't otherwise have. It was literally just watching what the player did. This was before Hearthstone had tools in it to be able to observe games, but you could still sit there and watch someone play or watch over their shoulder or whatever. It's just using public information. The problem was what he was doing with that information was making predictions about what the opponent would play next and the relative value of the cards in your deck. Uh, and as soon as Blizzard saw this talk that he gave, which I'd encourage you to go and watch, it's quite basic now compared to some of the, the more contemporary analyses of Hearthstone that have been done. There's no shortage of Reddit threads about this, but go watch the talk. It's quite interesting. Um, by giving the talk, he then solicited this response from Blizzard, which said, actually, you can't release this tool because it's going to make our game less fun, which is an absurd thing to say, but that's what they said. Uh, and they, they, sorry, actually, it's not quite as absurd as the first thing they said, which is that they thought it would break game balance. All this was doing was watching games and providing you with information. Anyway, this highlights a really interesting point from a game design perspective. Game data isn't game information, but often when we talk about game data from a blockchain game perspective, we think of them as the same thing. We think, hey, there's all this cool information and data about these games, and we write it to the blockchain, and that makes the experience more fun. Well, actually, from the traditional games world, you know that a lot of the time in a lot of game genres, you kind of rely on hiding information from the player. Even if it's there, even if they could observe it for themselves, they're maybe not looking at it at that point in time. And I think that's at the core of what happened with this Hearthstone thing, is that it, it did actually break game balance, and it, it did make it less fun if the players knew what was going to happen next. Ellie hadn't done anything wrong, but at the same time, the tool he made made the game theoretically less fun. So how do we deal with this as, a, as game designers in the blockchain game space? Well, there's a couple of interesting ways. I think the main thing to identify is that game information isn't game data. So if you're looking at it from the blockchain perspective, you don't have to think about the information that's available to the player as literally all of the data. They're not the same thing. If you flip it around, the same applies from a game designer's perspective. The technology options that you have on the blockchain side don't necessarily need to involve exposing all of the data to the player all of the time. In fact, most of the examples of interesting blockchain game stuff at the moment don't do that anyway. Um, so it's, it's worth bearing in mind, but you have to either address this and work with it, or you're going to have to work around it. Um, blockchain data and game data aren't necessarily the same thing. Game data isn't necessarily the same thing as game information. Uh, okay, final one, uh, rights holders. This is a completely different angle on the whole thing. Um, this picture, if you can't uh, figure it out or not familiar with it, is Microsoft's press conference from E3 last year, where not only did they announce 4 to 7, but they also announced the new Porsche GT2 RS. 
Porsche's flagship car, uh, top of their GT range, uh, was announced at a video games conference. Now, traditionally, the automotive and video games industries haven't actually had that much to do with each other. There's some synergy in games, but they're very different industries. But VW Porsche decided that this would be the place where they'd announce their new flagship car. It was on stage. Uh, it was a big deal that they did this. And this, this isn't some gimmick on their part. They obviously thought this through. They thought there's a reason why we should put this on stage at this video games event. And it's kind of because they have to. IP holders are starting to realize that the relationship they have with their owners, their players, their users, whatever they describe them as, is moving into the virtual space and away from the physical one. And at some point, there will be more people driving GT Porsches around in virtual reality than there will be in real life. Um, now, hopefully, obviously, there's some connections here to blockchain tech. But just very quickly, uh, to give you an idea of what that looks like from a rights holder player perspective, it doesn't look like this. Right now, in the games industry, if you're familiar with working franchise titles, it gets a bit messy really, really quickly. Um, because beyond your rights holder, you have all of these different layers until you get up to your player. I think we can solve that. I think uh, blockchain potentially has this, this benefit where we can connect them directly based on the things they're interested in. Items on a blockchain paralleled with technologies and things that players and rights holders and developers and publishers can work with. Uh, we're some way from making this work. Cars and sports games isn't the best place to start. I think we need to pick smaller targets, but we have the tech to fix this problem. OK, that's it. I'm not going to summarize because I'm out of time. Um, I'll just give a quick roundup as to what I'm working on. Lunarminds.io, sign up for more information, comes out later in the year, is awesome. Uh, Delox.io is a blockchain that doesn't have a cryptocurrency or a token. Uh, it's solely for the ownership of items. Uh, it's also the new home for Bitbind version 2, in case you're familiar with my older work on Bitbind. Uh, it uses Ethereum and Lightning for payments, and it's what runs Lunar Mines. Thanks very much. I'm Gareth Jenkins. Very good. Lots of questions, I think, arising from that. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure we're going to have time to. Uh, we're just going to set up for the panel, and while we're doing that, we will actually take some questions, though, if, sure. if people have them. Can you say your name and where you're from? David Mason, I work at Rovio. So just coming back to your question of ownership, do you think really that people don't realise that they don't own? Because in this world today, we've got a renter generation, we've got, you know, people buy clothes from Zara uh, and throw away three months later. They don't want to collect stuff in, in the physical world. So, you know, they buy, you know, they don't own their next Netflix content, etc. So you really see the ownership as being something that drives kind of blood. Absolutely, yeah. This was something that uh, I was concerned about that same topic four years ago when I started on this whole crazy blockchain games thing. Um, I spent two and a half years at the start of that four years exhibiting at, I think, 35 different events in the games industry showing blockchain games to people. And I was terrified that people wouldn't get what I got, which was that player ownership was this nice idea. And although players didn't understand blockchain and they didn't understand and half of the things that we're talking about now that they might at this point, one thing that was very, very clear to me is that people do really care about the things that they own and this idea that we could provide them with something that allowed them to concrete that technologically and actually from a legal perspective was a really big deal for them. And I think there are plenty of game genres and specific games where people behave like that. Uh, I used a screenshot from Eve earlier very deliberately. They're the basic, CCP's basically the only company who's behaved in a respectful manner in regards to players' items. They still don't actually own them. It's just the company kind of behaved like that. And I think that's the reason why they're still there and people are still playing Eve today. <laughs>